spare. The next section of the book has a picture of Harry with Diana, Princess of Wales. Uh, she's relatively makeup free. She's got her sunglasses pushed to the top of her head. She's staring straight into the camera. Is Harry? I'm guessing he's I don't know eight or nine years old. It's a lovely picture, I suppose one would say. And it's the section is part one out of the night that covers me. And Harry now has turned his thoughts to Bol Moral. And he talks about how there were always stories about Balmoral. And he always regarded Balmoral as a paradise. He describes it as a cross between Disney World and some sacred druid grove. He talks about all of the various things that he would be doing there and that he was uh, enjoying all of the activities. And he states that basically he was happy there. And he writes, in fact, it's possible that I was never happier than that one golden summer day at Balmoral, August 30th, 1997. He explains that uh, the Queen was there and Prince Philip and his brother and his father. And that basically the whole family was there apart from his mum because she was no longer part of it. And he explains that basically she either had been kicked out of the family or left, dependent upon who you'd asked. And she was um, away somewhere on holiday. And he wasn't altogether sure until somebody explains that he, sh his mum was in Paris. He then makes reference to the high mental wall, which he references in the Tom Bradby interview. And he explains... Such a horrid, tantalising feeling to know they're over there. These are memories he's talking about. Just on the other side, mere inches away. But the wall is always too high, too thick, unscalable. Not unlike the turrets of Balmoral. And he explained that she was away with this new friend, which, of course, must be, is reference to Dodi Fayed. And he talks about a holiday when they went to Saint-Tropez and how wonderful that was. And he's struggling to remember when Dodi Fayed first turned up. And he seemed to think the chap was okay. And so they've been in Saint-Tropez and that's when they think he thinks that Fayed first turned up. And then they've moved on to Balmoral. And... In that, he explains he can't really remember much about the first week at the castle. And he references some of the reporting that had gone on to help jog his memory. And he then questions why his memory isn't so good. And he writes, why should my memory organise experience like this? Is it genetics, trauma, some Frankenstein-esque combination of the two? Is it my inner soldier? assessing every space as potential battlefield? Is it my innate homebody nature, rebelling against a forced nomadic existence? Is it some base apprehension that the world is essentially a maze and you should never be caught in a maze without a map? Again, these thoughts do appear uh, more profound than one would expect from Prince Harry. And you can see here that it is a combination of what has been teased out of him and finessed by the ghost writer. What is apparent in these early stages of the book is that I'm not seeing any real influence from Harry's wife in terms of what has been uh, written, at least. Some of his behaviours, of course, are affected by the presence of Harry's wife. That much is clear. But it doesn't seem to me that there are chunks of it that would appear to have been either heavily influenced or even written by her. Now, of course, there have been suggestions made that the ghostwriter bailed partway through the project. And it might be that, if that's accurate, as we get further along, we'll see more influence and involvement of Harry's wife. Not only, of course, because she then becomes introduced into the story, so she's going to want to influence how she's portrayed, but just how she then writes about certain events or influences the recollection of them by Harry and 
perhaps at that juncture we see less of the presence of the ghostwriter, or he's still there, but the hand of Harry's wife weighs heavy upon proceedings. So it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. But it's very clear at this early juncture, there's nothing here that strikes me as the influence of Harry's wife. And it's important to make that note, because whilst we are analysing the book in terms of what its content is, we need to keep in mind the surrounding circumstances of its creation. According to Harry, I think in the interview, he'd been writing this for two years. And therefore, that means that his wife would have had significant involvement in the process because she has been around during that time. But also, importantly, this is during his sustained devaluation. Harry then talks about Balmoral and he describes what it's like inside and he talks about what the weather could be like and it's quite interesting learning about that. And he talks about another Prince Harry who got himself exiled, then came back and annihilated everything and everyone in sight. So he talks about his namesake and then references himself, stating, Born September the 15th, 1984, I was christened Henry Charles Albert David of Wales. But from day one, everyone called me Harry. He then continues talking about the... Um, interior of the property it's quite interesting it paints a vivid picture of what it looks like and also he talks about his grandmother and there's some anecdotes about her being there and he often talks about he talks about how a lot of it looks very similar and so you could almost get lost or you go through the wrong door and talks about bursting in on his father while he was getting dressed or while he was doing his headstands. It's quite interesting that Harry tells us that Charles engages in undertaking headstands because of some polo injuries to his back and his neck. And he does headstands every single day to alleviate the pain from the injuries. And there's more about the number of bedrooms and how it all looks. So it's, it's um, quite a description. And what's interesting, actually, is this shows the skill of the ghostwriter here. Because you recall from when I took the piss out of Finding Freedom, when the improbably named plastic faced Omid Scobie and the now in exile Carolyn Durant would describe events, it very much came across as padding. Almost like, hmm, we've nothing really to talk about here, so let's describe the interior of Soho House. Or, hmm, we're quite sparse in details because Harry's wife's diary hasn't given us a lot of material, so we're going to have to pad it with some descriptions about food. Here, and it's evidently the skill of the ghostwriter, evident, what he does is he meshes a description about what Balmoro looks like, the interior of which many people have not seen, but also weaves into that the recollections of Harry about his father, about his grandmother, about his grandfather. And accordingly, that is quite, uh, it makes interesting reading. He then moves on, of course, to the issue of being the spare. And the fact of Willie being the heir and him being the spare. And this is when you sense a degree of resentment when he talks about how the press referred to them as that and it, that it was shorthand used by his father and his grandparents and his mother also. Now, he refers to himself as being the shadow, the support, the plan B. What's interesting is that he makes the recollection that we have been told about in the press excerpts having the Spanish release, where he states, I was 20 the first time I heard the story of what Pa allegedly said to Mummy the day of my birth. So this whole thing about him saying, oh, fantastic, you've given me an air and despair, is hearsay. He didn't actually, of course, hear it himself. It was recollections 20 years later. And he states, a joke, presumably. On the other hand, minutes after delivering this bit of high comedy, 
Pa was said to have gone off to meet his girlfriend. So many a true word spoken in jest. So an early dig there about Camilla, of course. Interestingly, he then states that he didn't take any offence. And the, the idea of succession is just one of those things. It's like the seasons, it's like the weather and so forth. And therefore, he wasn't overly concerned about it. And he talks about being third in line and then basically he re remarks, therefore spare or no spare, it wasn't half bad to actually be one. So consequently, it's interesting that on the one hand, he gives the impression of this tremendous resentment of being spare, but at this point, maybe his views of course have changed, at this point, He's actually suggesting, hey, you know, not such a not such a bad thing at all, really. It's, um, you know, I'm a prince and that's not bad. Join me in the next video for more analysis of Spare.